When did they rebrand common sense as cynicism? We are in the middle of the biggest transformation in human society ever. We are going to face problems, challenges that we've never faced before. I think the really interesting part of that fraud is how he was able to co-op media and basically bleed into the whole fraud, both before and after the fraud broke. The traditional legacy media has lost every shred of trust. I think the advice now is get into AI compliance. <laughs> like, that, that is the job of the future. I worry that our government and our regulators are so far behind the curve in terms of what's actually going on. You can't take a single media source and look at it as a view of truth. If you're going to get involved with a hypey market like crypto, you have to look, well, all right, is this actually real? Julia said Burba, right? Take no one's word for it. Well, hello, everybody. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another Infinite Loops. Today, I have on a very, I almost wanted to make him a mystery guest, but he's not going to be a mystery guest. My guest today is Michael Brettenbach. Great name. Bach being one of my favorite uh, composers, who is an investment professional, used to be with the Bank of America, quant genius, which is why I like to talk to him. We're actually talking about maybe collaborating on some stuff. Oh, and by the way, he has a very well-known parody. Do you call it a parody account on, on Twitter, Michael? I don't even know what it is. It just started off as a place for me to vent and it kind of turned into this giant thing. And now I'm weirdly very famous in very small sections of the internet. I don't know. That's kind of I, I love it. We're going to get into uh, whether you could steal man uh, a case for getting rid of a non accounts. But for now, and guys, gals, everyone listening, Michael is not Ramp Capital. So. He's been on my podcast. As a matter of fact, Ramp was on the first Infinite Loops and one of the inspirations for starting it. Michael is not Ramp, but if you are in our little sector of FinTwit, you know who Michael is, and maybe we can all play a game and figure it out. Michael, welcome. We have so much to talk about uh, because you and I talk quite a bit just privately, and we have pretty simpatico opinions on a lot of stuff going on. But let's let's start with kind of the fucking crazy shit that's going on in traditional markets right now. Like everybody's, of course, is going to immediately think FTX. And that's not, in my opinion, a traditional market. But like we were chatting before we started recording and like there's a lot of weird stuff going on in 40 act markets. Please give us your take. Yeah. I mean, I think this is, it's kind of interesting. I think particularly with FTX, the most interesting aspect of that fraud isn't even the crypto angle. I think the really interesting part of that fraud is how he was able to co-op media to, and basically PR into oh. the lead into the whole, whole fraud, uh, both before and after the fraud broke, uh, and also complete ele elements of, uh, I guess you could call it regulatory capture, but almost kind of both ways. Um, so I think I'm worried that some people are learning the wrong lessons from the FTX Ponzi or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, maybe I'll be a little bit diplomatic because it's, uh, you know, alleged at this point, but you know, we all know. Allegedly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Until okay. he took to Twitter to make it not allegedly where he yeah. called, oh, woke people, they're idiots. This is all a grift. But my, yeah. question, my question that I'd love your opinion on is, I've talked to a lot of people about this, and it seems it's not evenly split. I want to get your take. A lot of the people I talk to think that this is just a classic grifter tale. Um, yes. Somebody who just happened to be pretty, like, Bernie Madoff 2.0, I guess, because of the way he was able to capture the imagination of a lot of people uh, through media, through all of that, but also pool a lot of super sophisticated investors. We'll leave the names yeah. off. But there were a lot of really sophisticated people um, backing 
him. Or the other, the other side of the, this argument is, no, 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 no. It's more than a grift. This was systematic, systemic failure. Where do you come down? Uh, I think there's a little bit of both. I, I think more when he started off, you know, there, when he started, uh, so Alameda started in 2017, I believe. FTX didn't launch until 2019. I think when he started off, it was legitimate. Okay, this is a kid that's well-connected. His, you know, parents, both law professors at Yale. He can raise capital quickly. Th this huge ARBs opened up and he's an ARB guy doing market making at Jane Street and maybe has a little bit of shadiness in his kind of uh, approach to things. Um, is able to raise capital quickly and take advantage of these ARBs and, you know, get the fund started up. But then there's alpha, alpha decay. And there's some questionable elements in crypto with, you know, the exchanges self-dealing against themselves. I think a lot of crypto insiders, um, there, it, there was no kind of question that Sam was a little bit, a little shady. I think the extent of it was that ended up being was a little surprising, but I, I don't think there were many people that didn't suspect there was some of the deals with, you know, Alameda having certain privileged rights, which all came to light as being true uh, early on where, you know, they had, you know, no leverage liquidation engine, had priority flow, uh, all that sort of thing, could see more information. Um, that, that stuff, I think, wasn't a surprise to a lot of people. I think what a surprise to a lot of people was just how far things went. Um, and I think also too, when the Terra Luna explosion happened, there was, he was very effective at creating the illusion that he almost benefited from that. Um, a few people did like Galois did and then Galois, like they lost half their capital and, uh, at FTX explosion and opera. So you know, there's all kinds of insane, insane things like that going on. But, uh, yeah, things are definitely worse than they uh, a lot of people that are even kind of cynical about Sam, uh, you know, that's how things played out. The question is how, at what point did things get really bad? Um, I think in the spring would probably be my guess, but, you know, it's it's hard to say. Uh, I think more will come out over time. What I find interesting is that there was over the same period that, you know, FTX has existed, there was two insane extremely shady 40 act regulated mutual funds that had massive frauds, mismarking derivatives to the point where they're tinkering models um, and media relative attention is bad, nothing. And, you know, in terms of systematic risk, the global financial system, 40 act mutual funds are more important. Yeah. And, yeah. and you should expect, uh, you know, there's literally almost a hundred years of regulatory yeah, you know, regulatory history there. You should expect that to work. Um, if you're putting money on a crypto exchange and you don't have any risk of it blowing up, I mean, you're just frankly an idiot. I mean, these things that are hacked all like even if there's not a fraud, they get hacked like every two years. Like you, you should get your money in if you want to do the money in, trade out. And now there's all sorts of on-chain alternatives, which in many respects are, are safer. Uniswap's doing more volume than Coinbase right now. Um, the main reason to maybe keep capital on, on there is for collateral for derivatives. And that kind of really was FDX offshore stick. Um, but I think people are looking at this, oh, crypto, 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 and not media, media, media. And, you know, there's a lot of other stuff going on with the media right now, which I think in terms of, you know, what are reliable sources of truth and that sort of thing going on to keep an eye on. And this kind of plays into that. And uh, I think after it was very obvious to anyone with half a brain that this was a giant fraud, um, the fact that they were still, you know, formerly reputable media sources kind of covering his ass was, I'm, I'm cynical about these sort of things and it kind of blew my mind. Yeah. And, you know, I was just talking to uh, uh, Chris Denny Brown, who is heads up our VC Infinite uh, Adventures. And like the thesis that I have is that new media is just getting going. Honestly, people say it's saturated, <laughs> no way. And, and one of the reasons why is like the traditional legacy media has lost every shred of trust, any individual, however gullible, 
Yes. It, they are now, you know, if you look at it as an S curve adoption, right? We are now up here where even the most gullible, you know, whatever loyalty to whatever tribe. So, you know, MSNBC, if you're a liberal, Fox, if you're a conservative, you know, newspapers, Wall Street Journal, if you're kind of in the middle of the road to conservative, New York Times, which has kind of become Pravda. And yeah. like even people who used to like totally believe that, you know, they'd never get it wrong. They're always a, now even they are just like these. What is going on with these people? And and the trust factor has, and again, you bring the point out really, really well. Obvious fraud. Yeah. He, he himself admits it in the conversations, the text conversations he's having with friendly uh, reporters that then go about not being so friendly by printing the whole thing. But the point is that that there were still people clinging to that old narrative. I mean, like, what is going on with that, in your opinion? I mean, I think I think it is what it is. I mean, you you can't look, you can't take a single media source and look at it as a view of truth. Um, I think that's why Twitter is very effective too, because you're getting the fire hose from all these different, as you would put it, reality tunnels, and you're able to kind of synthesize between all of them to get a sense of truth. Uh, it's actually to the point where I always view like if there's issues with Twitter, it could actually. Um, uh, be almost like a systematic risk to certain industries like like crypto in particular even though crypto is extremely active on telegram and discord there's the common square element is is there uh so uh and now you're also seeing stuff like twitter become you know battlegrounds for you know who can control censorship and whatnot and if i look at i look at twitter and the kind of war going on there is a big preview to what we're going to start seeing for you know especially with the text-based um ai models coming up where like if, if you want like when i was in an undergrad is when arthur anderson blew up and enron and all that and everyone said oh, if you want to get a good job for the next few years um you know switch your uh, your major to accounting um i think the advice now is get into ai compliance <laughs> like that that is the job of the future um you're i was even seeing it at, at a b of a of predictive analysis like you know at the conferences for their ai and whatnot just because i mean they have all so much customer data there and you know, it gets, you, you see it in their sell side stuff being put out, like anonymized and properly and ethically and whatnot. And you see it congressional temp, you know, testimony, and you, you even hear about it being whispered in the ear of the president. Um, there's a lot of, you know, model risk management controls, you know, things in loans like algo racism and all, there's all kinds of ethical stuff. And that's the old predictive stuff. That's not even getting into the new generative door, which is why well, things really been, yeah, it's been the you know, big shift in the last year or so. Yeah. Well, as many of my listeners know, but I always like to disclose with, so they understand that I might be talking my book or have motivated reasoning. I am both an investor in and chairman of the board of Stability AI, which is an open source AI uh, platform. Um, and so I kind of have a ringside seat into the things that you are talking about, and you are absolutely right. Um, the, you know, the size of this innovation, especially as you point out well, um, with generative AI, uh, very, very different. And we're not going to turn this into an AI seminar. I have David Ha, our principal uh, market uh, or model architect who used to be the head of Google Brain in Tokyo and is considered one of the greatest AI model designers living today. He's going to give us the masterclass in, in that. But to, from a point of view of somebody who spent most of his career on Wall Street and has been deeply involved with compliance, it's easier, frankly, for tech, uh, for quants, uh, because we can just show, yeah, here's the model. You want us to generate it as of whatever you pick the date, Mr. SEC examiner, you'll see that the stocks we ended up buying were the ones generated. And, you know, we didn't use third party research. We didn't use soft dollars at my old company. Um, so we we were pretty, you know, clean in terms of compliance issues. But now, man, you are right, because, um, you know, these I, I'm talking to a bunch of people who are like the pioneers of AI generated funds. 
and yeah. um the stuff that is going on there is both ridiculously fascinating to me because michael you should see some of these numbers they're putting up like yeah. one one fund that i talked to uh how'd you do in march 2020 oh yeah we were up 30 percent in march 2020 right. and and i said because because we let the model pick and and um so got really sort of interested in that but in terms of the regulatory infrastructure and and let's keep it somewhat simple and just talk about financial markets for right now right yeah uh i i worry and and i brought this up in an earlier podcast I worry that our government and our regulators are so far behind the curve in terms of what's actually going on. And as you yourself said, 40 Act regulation has a nearly 100 year history now, right? Yeah. The SEC was created uh, to address the pool concerns and, and grifters, right? Joe Kennedy, yeah. uh, FDR said, you, why'd you pick yeah. this criminal as your guy? It takes a crook to find a crook said FDR. But what are your thoughts? Do you think that do you think that the regulatory because by the way, I am all in favor of sensible regulation. It brings trust into markets. It it makes certain that there's some oversight and that people are actually paying attention to things. So I'm not an anti-regulation guy at all. What right. I am is skeptical that given the nuances and different types of models, multimodal models. Uh, like, are, do we have, does, does government have the bandwidth to, to regulate this? I mean, they will. It's a question if they do it well. I mean, I think you have to look at different markets, segments of the market and break it down. I think to some, my kind of view is that the banks are in the United States at this point are kind of quasi-nationalized and they are, get a kind of hall pass to take on a few risk activities and the skill of the CEO there is to manage that ball pass as well as possible. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just the experience of, of working at a large institution like that for, for over five years, um, you know, I feel very safe, like with that, I don't feel it's there very much systematic risk there. I feel like there are some operational risks that are almost caused by excessive operational risk controls, if anything, right? Uh, you know, there's, you know, I kind of have a famous line there where I was like considered this voodoo priest because I was able to get uh, a SQL server. So things would be taken off of access files on shared drives. Um, and you know, it's like, what do you do here? Well, I did this. Wow. You know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And now I can do that in 10 seconds and have 8,000 Linux, you know, whatever. Um, and I could have chat GPT write the code for me to do all that. Um, you know, that's, that's another thing you see with the AI stuff is just getting, and we've talked about this before about, uh, you know, getting things on prem and actually allowing large corporations to use this stuff. Um, and you know, right now there's, you know, some cell site analyst trying to use chat GTP to write like some letter and he's typing stuff into his phone and then going back and forth just cause it's completely blocked. So I think the, yeah, that's, that's a big theme. I think you see right now is uh, mm -hmm. kind of the scale versus anti-scale dynamic going on. If you think about what like Amazon does for, or a lot of these large NASDAQ 100 names, what they do in the industry is they kind of rent scale to smaller companies. That's effect, the effect of what the cloud is. Right. And there, you're going to start seeing some of that with AI coming forward. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of the other counter trend is, is the crypto space where that's, you know, decentralization. But then you're also seeing this whole OTC blow up where there's six firms all intertwined lending OTC to each other that all just completely exploded. So, um, you know, like you were saying the, when we talked the other night, how AI is a tool, kind of the same thing with crypto. You can use it for a lot of different things, um, especially like I kind of view Bitcoin as separate from a lot of these Ethereum L2 platforms. That's, that's almost how a good limits test if someone really kind of gets what's going on there. If they talk about, oh, I don't get Bitcoin, well, like you don't get the space. That's really more of a, a new type of precious metal. Total address, addressable market there, I think is kind of smaller. It doesn't really do that much. 
Um, I've always thought it was interesting. I've always thought it had a lot of problems. The Ethereum stuff, I think, is actually a legitimate technology that's going to matter moving forward. Uh, it doesn't have to displace the entire financial system. A lot of these crypto maxis will go start talking crazy. Um, the way to approach crypto, in my opinion, if you want to talk about crypto for a little bit, sure, is uh, a lot of people will have either an extremely bearish, it needs to be regulated, these are all grift, this is all fraud view, or they'll be, oh, this is the future, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. There's not really any good tech now that can hide privacy on, on crypto. Like, um, there's some things that are being worked on, um, the secret network, I'm not endorsing that, but some of the concepts they're working on are good. There's a few other new startups that just had some big rounds that are allowing stuff. I mean, we talked about it the other day when we were talking about uh, how people are pushing gaming as a great use case for, for crypto. And I think the line was, uh, uh, do you really want your grandkids to know all the things you did in Grand Theft Auto? <laughs> like, you want that on the blockchain forever. It's like, you know, in 2009 in GTA 4, you threw a Molotov cocktail at this prostitute. It's like, you don't you want that on the blockchain? That's no, yes, and no. I'm the biggest offender because my son Patrick knew all the cheat codes for Grand yes. Auto. And whenever I would go up to his room and take over the command from him, I went, First off, kid, put all the cheat codes in. <laughs> well, I want all the RPGs, yeah, yeah. exactly. So that's it. I, I always thought, you know, how funny I thought it was when we were talking about it. I think it's funny now, but it's true, it's funny because it's true. There is a lot of stuff you do not want on the blockchain. Yeah. And so some of the use case for NFTs too, that's the, that's the kind of thing. Now, some of these newer technologies are, and I'm almost remiss to even bring these up because I don't want to draw regulatory attention to them until they get more mature. But, um, and also some of them, if designed properly, could also make for the most evil central bank digital currencies ever known to man, which is another risk. Like even if you're into crypto and bullish crypto, there's a lot of systematic risks. There's a lot of, you know, societal risks that are being discussed, but, um, you know, with, 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 I think they'll eventually be more of a situation where you could have selective privacy, uh, hopefully, if there's not a lot of big regulatory crackdowns kind of stuff where I can prove I'm a credit investor with something like a zero knowledge proof. Uh, and I can prove to you, you know, that I'm in a country where I'm allowed to do business with you. I don't tell you which one, give it my this selective privacy. If I own art, I can show it only to certain people, or I could show the high res file to certain people. There's a lot of things like that that could really solve a lot of problems. If everything's NFT, like, do I want my airline things in one wallet with my art? It, it's really, it's really problematic. And, uh, there's a lot of issues with front running, copy trading, um, Sometimes you want to be able to advertise those too. So I think that some of the stuff with blockchain, once it gets to that level, really takes things to the next level. But also keep in mind, 2017, Crypto's Kitties was blowing up the Ethereum network. No one thought any, wasn't sure that any of this technology would work. So Bitcoin had kind of, uh, was sort of working, but then a lot of the issues I had with worrying about it, forking were going down. And the issue of Ethereum scaling as a kind of blockchain computer was under question. Um, all those answers have really, the, the scaling question's really been handled. There's all these new bridging technologies and layer twos and just networks are moving faster. Proof of stake, where you're not paying off all this yield to miners, it's actually a yielding asset. Um, the fact that it, the crypto ecosystem could actually support like 40 billion Terra Luna blow up in a weird way is bullish. Like the fact that it can support someone building a $10 billion scam on top of it is kind of bullish technology. Now, the question is, we have this technology, um, although the fact that we have automated market makers where I can just create a token and create an automatic market on it, a smart contract, and it will be there forever. And anyone can trade online on blockchain instantly without any exchange ever having listed. That's amazing. That happened way sooner than I would have expected um, because of the constant price function type market makers. I thought we would have had to get to the point where we had true order books, which is kind of what Uniswap V3 is getting to, but um, all that's been 
really much more optimistic than I would have thought from a technology perspective. Uh, but still, like, there's a lot of issues. A lot of people, a lot of regulatory uh, bodies are reluctant to have real world assets on chain. Um, we're sort of gotten there with dollars. And that's been the game changer with properly monitored off chain collateralized stable coins. That's huge. But there's not US treasuries there yet. Like MakerDAO is working on some stuff, some other things. If crypto is going to really grow, that kind of link between the real world and the, uh, like what the tech people would say is the meat space and the block space has to have linkages that are legally robust. Yeah. Um, you made a lot of points there that I thought a lot about. Uh, let's start with um, the, the, what I agree with you is to me a black mirror scenario if we all of a sudden get uh, a fed coin uh, yes. because say goodbye to freedom if they get digital control of your money yeah that's kind of that's game over right i used to say to young people i would tease them and i would pull out a usually a 50 or a 100 right because uh, that's what the black market likes a uh, hundred dollar American bill, and I would hold it like this, and you know, make it, make it snap, and I'd say, "Kiddos, you are looking at the original Bitcoin." <laughs> yep. In other words, cash. You could couldn't trace it. Why are all black markets priced in USD? Think of all the businesses the mafia used to own, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But so so like if I were an enterprising, you know, big government type, and uh, you know, authoritarian, I, I, that that's where I'd make all my cases. You, just what you said. The mafia used cash. They did yeah. that for horrible purposes, like uh, black markets. Well, of course they're priced in, in dollars because they're off the book. And like you're a reasonable low information person, like who scans the news might look at that and think, oh, good for the feds. They're finally addressing some of this shit. Right. But yeah. Once, once that ship sails, you know, say goodbye to any kind of financial freedom, uh, yeah. and unless you're willing to like live as an as an exile in a barter economy. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely those are big meta trends to watch out for. I mean, there's definitely I mean, people have been so busy fighting over the ability to have reasonable freedom, free discourse online. That everyone's forgotten about the whole data privacy thing and the fact that everything you're doing online being scraped by governments and large corporations every transaction you do um you know increasingly cash is less and less everything's square your taco truck you're paying with credit card now there's less and less cash businesses um everything's being recorded by a you know you, you go buy from that taco truck your phone's with you google knows where you are you're you're you know you're paying it uh, becomes an entry in a database Everything about you being constantly recorded. Like people worried about being microchip. You like the phone is the full on giant. Your microchip. <laughs> yeah. Like it's the highest, craziest, you know, it's a supercomputer. Like, yeah. Um, th that's why I refuse to go for the Apple watch. I'm not giving my heart rate at the same time, you know? Same with me, buddy. I, yeah. I, uh, my wife, my kids, they all swear by the Apple watch. And I said, you know what? I'll do the Apple Watch when they can prove that it can save my life, like before, you know, give me a heads up, get to the hospital, Jim, because you're about to have a massive heart attack. Then, you know what? Then I might think about the Apple Watch. But for right now, just to have all of that physical data going out and being collected, it's like I, I made a joke over the weekend about Twitter where there's this exchange. Uh, where the, the person who begins the tweet is like, um, are there, is there anyone hiring uh, uh, in tech asking for tens of thousands of people? And so the director of cyber uh, crime for the NSA responds to the tweet and he says, we're hiring. <laughs> and, and then so it just keeps going. And this guy gets the banter, gets the vibe of social media better than like the marketing departments of the majority of for-profit companies. Like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and NSA spends more time there. Yeah. True. So it gets yeah. better just through practice. But the fact is, like, 
you know, it turned, I, I did it as a joke, right? I, I retweeted the thing saying, you know, we time to reevaluate when, when the man who's in charge of cybercrime for the NSA is better at Twitter than like half the brands out there. Yes, he spends more time there, but the, I, this is a larger topic that I'm absolutely obsessed by. And that is, as you know, I'm not sh shy about sharing my opinion that like we are in the middle of the biggest transformation in human society ever. Yeah. And like, okay, you, you got to tune in to the fact that like all the old models are collapsing, they're disappearing and they're being replaced with, in my estimation, better models for the most part, um, more, more ability at, uh, you know, we're going from mass markets to mass customization, right? We did it with Canvas at OSAM. It's why Franklin Templeton yeah. wanted to buy us because we had the tech that scaled that allowed for one-to-one -one customization to Michael, right? If you went to an advisor who used Canvas, literally they could customize it just to you. And, you know, they could eliminate um, uh, holdings in your public portfolio that were, were your concentrator, right? So my point is that I think that like a lot of this is amazing and awe-inspiring and good for us as a society, but that in no way negates the fact that we are going to face problems, challenges, uh, things that we've never faced before. And we've got to have at least a thesis around, okay, how are we going to deal with these new and better problems, right? Let's stipulate they're going to be better problems, but they're going to be massive problems. What are your thoughts? I think about this a lot. Like, you know, my daughter's eight now, and I'm trying to start to now introduce certain ideas about like data footprint. Like, maybe we shouldn't put your name in the Disney Plus account. Let's just keep it under mine. Like, you know, because you can't really win the war, but you can kind of fight a guerrilla war where you're kind of, you know, you're retreating and burning fields and can slow the spread of, uh, of some of this bad stuff, but I don't think it's a winnable war. Um, I don't know. It's like, I'm very skeptical of this stuff, but then like I go on, uh, you know, chat GPT and it's like, like I was forced to use R at, at, uh, at B of A just cause the, um, it was very difficult to get packages and the area was in the bank. So it's like, when I came in and I was doing all these transformation, it's like, all right, we're going to do code. Um, things are done. Like a lot of stuff that's done being done in VBA. I took my boss in, I wrote a quick program that generated a million random integers and printed it on the screen. He's like, okay, we can do code. Um, but I couldn't do Python. I wanted so R. So I've been trying to do R for five years. So it's like, all right, now I, I should pro do, do proper Python like everyone else. Right. Uh, the GTP about amazing, amazing for just, you know, learning over and, you know, just doing stuff with web GUIs. I never really had a chance to do like, uh, you know, flask and all these other different libraries, um, a day, like things that I've been meaning to do for like five years, Re really effective. Um, but then, you know, I also try to you know play with it and see if I can get it to do stuff. And I, you can even see as they've released that model, um, they've put more and more handcuffs on it and the quality of the outputs for certain things have gone lower. Code seems to be all right because code's pretty, you know, there's only a few things where I've heard of, of the handcuffs going on there with people like asking you to do like SQL injection scripts and that kind of stuff. But for the most part, that's kind of been all right. Um, I think open source opens up some doors for good or for better or worse there where, you know, I've seen things like the, uh, the GPT 4chan model where they took GPT JS and they fine tuned it on 4chan and then ran it and it, uh, it invented, um, some new things I didn't even know were horrible that it could do. Uh, <laughs> Neuro more. Some, yeah. The. The hard, hard, but some of the responses are also really intriguing. Like it was, it was very interesting to watch just intellectually. So, I, I think open source and the ability to custom trade on data sets will will be interesting. I mean, this is space I've been watching for a while. Even on image gen, like I was playing with uh, Deep Dream Generator from Google. Like I'm grandfathered into the Patreon 
program for the extra compute time, which now has stable diffusion versus the old and new and a few other models too, which is kind of interesting because I can just take a few prompts and I can compare, you know, old stable diffusion, new stable diffusion and see what the particle collider comes up with. Um, it's really interesting to see how that works. So I think a lot of those, in terms of the scale, anti-scale theme, I think a lot of this stuff going on with um, with AI really empowers a lot of these small companies that would maybe re previously require a whole team to do code or write content. Now you can run a boutique and you know use the force multiplier. So in some respect, and meanwhile, the larger corporations are going to be dealing with on-prem, off-prem issues, and they're going to be spending, um, I used to have a joke about the $100,000 spreadsheet, just getting certain data inputs moved around a large corporation will literally cost $100,000. So small companies don't have to worry about that. So in some respects, I think these smaller, more nimble, but teeth like companies now have a huge edge against larger corporations in some respects. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, you know, as uh, a vertical in O'Shaughnessy uh, Ventures is our venture division, which we call Infinite Adventures, because that was the original term for venture capital, which I like very much. The other one that I really like that I just learned about a little while ago was uh, for a while, people were calling it liberation capital, which I love that. And, and it was essentially because when it started to, you know, uh, become a thing, right? It was because of the, the traitorous eight who left Shockley's lab because he was such a megalomaniacal, just power freak, micromanager, everything. He was a narcissist, you know, yeah. and a genius. Yes. But like a horrible manager <laughs> and, and all of his engineers loved working with each other, but they hated this guy. And the thing that's interesting, they didn't even think of starting their own company because that's yeah. how much the culture had changed from, you know, the, the robber barons, right? Everyone's name was on the fucking company. Carnegie yeah. Steel, JP Morgan, right? Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fetter, and Smith. They even included the guys at the end. And, and that was, again, yeah, what was, you put your name on the door, your yeah. reputation's on the line. Not only is your cash on the line, your reputation's on the line. I think there's a lot to recommend that, but then we switch to the era of big government, big business, big labor, and like the idea that these brilliant uh, chip designers could go and form Fairchild or Intel or whatever didn't even occur to them, right? And then they ran into this guy who was like, why don't you guys just start your own company? And they were like, there's a great book, The Power Law, that covers this this yeah. Uh, happening. It's just fascinating because you're reading it like, and that gets us back to reality tunnels, right? The reality tunnel of that yes. time was I can't start my own company because, you know, I need scale. I need all this. That's why I'm intrigued by your thesis of scale versus, um, versus the, the small symbol, anti scale. Um, it's like all the pitches we get right now are from the small companies who, like are laughing in a big company. We're about to um, uh, fund a, a, a very nascent startup, but is essentially they're giving uh, tiny boutiques like a huge back office that allows them to reach not just their little circle that used to encompass their, their target uh, market for clients. They can now reach nationally and globally. And they couldn't afford to do it in the past. Our tech genius kids have got it figured out. It, the, the, and again, I love it when the market is the one that's giving the signal. The line that they have of boutique real retailers just here in New York, okay? Yep. Just in New York City, they have over 500 on their waiting list to, to use this platform of tech. And, and so... We're going to see that everywhere, I think. Yeah. There's a the counter argument to that, I think, is that you do run into some risk. Like when Parler got shut down during all that insanity around the election, it's a good example where some of these centralized providers could shut down. And I think that's to further bring in like the crypto angle, like the censorship resistance portion of that is kind of an answer to that, but it doesn't necessarily work in every situation. 
So there's a lot of these these common, you know, themes going on. There's a natural tendency, I think, for these large corporations to kind of, you know, things like cloud rent out scale, but then there's sort of a dependency on on that. So it's the, these two ten, this is tension between these two competing desires that I think are important to watch. Uh, and yeah, you know, this matters from investing too. When you're looking at equity, you're looking at venture, um, we're looking at moats. Um, you know, all, all the all this comes into play. Yeah, one of the other things that we we're chatting about, um, uh, which maybe some of our more clever listeners might be able to start to infer what big Twitter account you might be, but um, the the idea that I was fascinated by when you first uh, sprang it on me is like. Cynicism can sometimes be a pretty big comparative advantage. Expound on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think you you sometimes quote uh, the author like "always keep buying." I think that's that's Nick, kind Nick, of a good Nick Majuli. Nick Majuli. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, so I think that's kind of a good base case. You want to kind of be careful not to become uh, a full on doomer. But being cynical and being cautious and being responsible and being the adult in the room, I think, I mean, especially in crypto, I mean, crypto, I describe, this is like the double black diamond of behavioral economics. Yeah. Like the, the, I might put this out as a piece, just like, you know, 20 rules for how to actually properly invest in crypto, because there are huge advantages of it, especially in DeFi, where there's, you know, that market closes, when the market's open, there's zero duration yields, which are amazing. Um, and are over collateralized and there's some risk there. It's not, you know, f free, there's smart contract risk. It's uncorrelated. There's a lot there. That's really positive. That works really well in an overall portfolio. Um, but also sometimes it sucks. Like right now there's some DeFi plays that are still viable, but a lot of the stablecoin stuff, especially with what the fed's done, like you want to be pulling that out into treasure and in, into T-bills, um, just cause the way things work, uh, and maxis aren't necessarily doing that. Um, so you, I think with, with something like crypto, and, and maybe you could also extend this to equities, you want to feel underinvested when the market is just shooting up. And um, you want to feel smart enough that you have cash on the sidelines to buy when everyone's in a full-on panic. And you can just be the kind of buyer of last resort. Um, and this kind of works, you know, it's NFTs. It's kind of like, well, that's a lot of people think Warren Buffett does, even though it's not what it really does. No. Um, yeah. But, but that's, if you can, if you're going to get involved with a hypey market like crypto, you have to look, well, all right, is this actually real? Um, it's helpful if you're actually able to force yourself to be bearish on part of it because it prevents you from getting, you know, bubble brain. Um, you want to figure out which portion of this actually serve a societal purpose. It isn't just, you know, crap. Um, and you want to be under allocated to it. And yeah. also if something has crazy drawdowns, the same with equities, it's like, why aren't you hundred percent equities or the same? Why are you hundred percent Bitcoin? Um, there's you just want to be smart about things. And no one is having this common sense discussions about how to properly incorporate crypto into traditional, uh, you know, portfolios. Yeah. What roles and advantages it can play. So as, as I listened to you, the reason that I, I uh, enjoyed having that conversation is I just keep hearing newly asset verba, right? Take no one's word for it. That is the, the motto of the Royal Society, which gave birth to the scientific method. Um, and uh, it's just common sense, right? Yeah. Like it, it the, 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 I think I might have said when we were chatting about this originally, when did they rebrand common sense as cynicism? Like, <laughs> I don't know, but I think some people also in crypto are uh, like, look, crypto and are too cynical where they, there's like nothing there. This is all a scam. And I think that is going too far as well. Like, I think it's like the Aristotle, you know, virtue and moderation is, is the way to go on this one. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a binary thinking type person, right? Everything is a continuum the, everything should be either a yes, no, but the biggest category should be a maybe, right? 
and and when you put when you when you train yourself to think that way it it doesn't make you have an urge right to be a a maximalist or a complete troll and hater it's just yeah. like you know i think frankly i just think that is suboptimal thinking and that if you if you want to like achieve your objectives and your goals you're just doing yourself a massive disservice by being binary, right? Being yes, no, zero, one. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Everything pretty much is, you know, a maybe. Yeah. The other thing that's not helpful for, I think a lot, way a lot of people are thinking about crypto is it's increasingly become politicized and kind of a red blue issue and kind Which of more really weird. I, how, how did that happen? Well, I'd actually say the one exception is weirdly the NFT communities because it's filled with, quite frankly, like a lot of just artists, potheads and and that type of more, more, it's more of a left-leaning scene mixed in with hardcore libertarians. Right. The NFT community, I would say, is the one place in America right now where there's um, people with that wide a political spectrum actually just getting along and hanging out. <laughs> like, we'll go to conferences, we'll have awesome parties and... You know, all all kinds of crazy stuff. It's like a really, really interesting scene, the NFT scene. Um, like, I recommend people checking it out. Just, uh, it's a good way to actually learn some of the blockchain tech in a very simple way. But uh, there's a lot of interesting characters involved there. And th there's only been one real, I think, political issue that that crept up with something with the, uh, you have the ENS, uh, one of the old tweets from one of the ENS founders, which is, we ever see like dot .eth, but Twitter handles, whatever. That's the service yeah. that that. Yeah, that's the only example of any kind of of uh, of uh, stress, maybe that kind of came up between the two. But for the most part, it's 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 actually kind of interesting to see those all those different uh, types of people mostly getting along. Yeah, that's that's interesting too because I think your comment about NFTs being a, an easier path to understanding yeah. the underlying structure of crypto and Ethereum. I agree completely. Um, it, it certainly made it much easier for an old like myself to figure out that market a little bit better. Um, and, you know, there, that's really interesting that you say that because it, 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 I am dismayed by this tribalism that, you know, in tribe out in in network out network like and it it plays to one of our you know basic biases as you know domesticated primates which is you can randomly assign people to different groups right so i could you could have a you could build me a random number generator and yeah. i would, i would say um okay michael's in group a Jim is in group B, Tom's over with Michael, et cetera, et cetera. Just completely generated by random, complete randomization. And yet the behavior of the people in their group changes almost instantaneously and almost and incredibly dramatically. Like if you take, here's a here's hundred grand, Michael, um, you get to distribute it. You know what? Yeah, I'm not going to say it's you, but like, so Tom, who's also in your group, is like he gets that money he just met you he's like two to three times as likely to give you a bunch of money and not me give me any because i'm in the other group right yeah. and and so these like i have my current podcast that's up is is with a guy who wrote a book called the great uh redesign and and basically he's talking about like he's a he's a star trek guy and like he 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 yeah. loves that kind of abundance and which I love. The only utopian sci-fi, everything else dystopian. Exactly, exactly right. Uh, but you know, he made a point that like, wouldn't it be cool if we could figure out how to figure out a way that hey, we're team human race, and we got we got a lot of shit we got to solve, and then so we run snippets from the show, and like the one that we were running was that particular one. And I looked it up because I remember like humans share 99.9% .9 of our genes are the same. Yeah. 01% is the difference. I, like every time I see that, and that's from, that's from uh, uh, the, uh, the department of whatever <laughs> gene. 
<laughs> but but the point is, is like, wow, that blows me away that we could sow all of this hatred, all of this, you know, us versus them from point zero one percent, right? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, our society is evolving at a much faster pace than like we're, we're designed to be, you know, small tribes spearing deer and cooking them over fire at best. Like really, we're like small monkeys on the ground, you know, finding scavenging. But like, yeah, like, you know, this is all Richard Dawkins stuff. Just, you know, the society is growing at a way faster pace than, you know, our evolution. And, uh, you know, we, as you kind of alluded to before, we're just chimpanzees that have the hydrogen bomb. So, but there's 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 an alternate take on that, which I was just reading about last night, which I thought was pretty cool. I'm I'm not remembering who the thinker was. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, but he he was trying to he like did this like what? How do we distinguish human beings, Homo sapiens, from like animals? Yeah. And 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 what he alighted upon was we are the only known species on this particular rock um that can have conversations across generations and he called it time binding humans are the only creatures as that we know who knows about the dolphins and the whales right and crows man if you want to look into oh, smart yeah. birds look into crows yeah they can they can recognize your face and like they they crazy there's a great pbs documentary on this yeah yeah i'm i mean the, the the whole thing i love those documentaries because yeah. they're they're super smart but like i i really did think that was a really interesting point we are the only species that can communicate across gen generations but also can build a wealth of knowledge, cumulative cultural evolution, which, by the way, is how we got those hydrogen bombs, right? It's how we got the iPhone. It's how we got like this communication that this Zoom that we're communicating over right now. And the thing that's cool about it is cumulative cultural evolution affects us physically. The book, The Weirdest People in the World, about the West, right, and why we're so rich versus other societies, was kind of delves into we have we're weird. In other words, we like we think scientific method is a great way to uh, come up with new stuff. But one of the thing, the arresting parts of that book, which he hits you with right up front, which I thought was smart, is cultural evolution affects we and humans. Physically, and yeah. the and the and the proof thesis or proof uh, that they offered there is that when you take super fast fMRIs of the brain, the structure of a very highly literate person, and then an, of an illiterate person, our brains are shaped differently. And the thing that w where did evolution, m Mama Nature, take uh, our ability to read? Where did it put it in the brain? It it took space from the old uh, hyper hyper uh, attenuated um, facial recognition part of our brain. Why did it do that? Well, because back when we were killing those animals with our spears and cooking them over our newly discovered fire, it was really important for us to be able to recognize at a distance whether Grog coming through the bushes over there was a friend or a foe. Right. So facial recognition was a big part of the brain. And mama evolution was like, I don't need that anymore. So, but the external stimuli, so Gutenberg and his press, right, changed our brains. What do you think these things are doing, Joel? Ooh. Different, so all sorts of stuff. There's, there's another interesting study, it's kind of similar, um, where they took looked at London cab drivers and just over time, their hippocampus the memory yeah. like expanded. Like, you know, it was interesting because I hooked up an emulator to play uh, Mario Kart with my kids. So I yeah. got some like old school like games from like 92. So I like loaded up the Zelda game like from the SNS, which came out in 90, 92. I haven't played this thing in 93. And I looked, I, I know every little spot on that map. I didn't even play it a lot, but this is like from my 12, you know what I mean? Or younger. And it's like, wow, man, I, I, somewhere in the back of my brain is that entire map is just still in there. 
Um, you know, that's, you know, there's a guy, uh, Flynn, he died recently. That was that, that was his life's work was they call it the Flynn effect. The fact that IQs from 1900 till I can't remember when his res research left off. I think it was late nineties or early aughts. Anyway, um, he proved after like, you know, normalizing for all of the other extraneous factors that IQs had got, gone up significantly. And one of the reasons why he cited they had was conceptual reasoning because of, wait for it, video games. Mm -hmm. And um, he's a really interesting dude. Google him. You'll find a bunch of YouTubes of him giving spe speeches. Um, but, you know, there's good. I mean, most people choose to root against. I look for things to root for. Yeah. I'd rather be positive than negative. It's not that I am positive about everything. I'm negative about a lot of stuff. I just choose yeah. not to like rant and and troll and like you know focus on it endlessly. I, uh, I contain it to my Twitter account, so I can just vent there, so I can keep happy here. You actually, you actually, you, you, it's a, your therapy uh, oh. of, of of your Twitter account is brilliant. I think we when we first got to know each other, like I think that might have been one of the first things I sent to you. Like your alter ego is like amazing because you get to just like. Yeah, I'm I'm only docs to a very small number of, of circles too. So yeah, you're in the you're you're in there. Well, that goes yeah. without saying. Yeah. But I am gonna ask you the question. I am making you the Lord High Emperor of the world. You cannot kill anybody, you can't put anyone in a re-education camp, you can't do any of that stuff to them, but I am gonna hand you a magic microphone. You're going to speak two things into that microphone, and you are going to incept the entire world's population. All 8 billion of us are going to wake up whenever our morning is, and we're going to say, I just thought of the two greatest things. I'm going to start doing them immediately today. What you got for me? See, a lot of people hop right into this. So I, I didn't really think about this too much, but I thought about this past. Like, you know that a tail risk you're taking on with this? Like, well, you just, you could like unintended second order effects. I mean, you could really destroy humanity with this power, right? You could. And I've been in one of the things I love that you're giving that answer because like the, <laughs> the second and tertiary order effects of seemingly benign changes yes. can like destroy humanity. <laughs> if I say just like be excellent to each other, like that could set off like world wars, like four through five. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so maybe, maybe I'll go for something like super, super conservative, which will still probably set up a, a world war, but we'll, we'll see. Um, most people when they construct portfolios, don't consider taxation, consider taxation canvas. Best thing about it, taxes. Yep. That's the real alpha there. When you put your portfolio together, second is prop for diversification, true proper diversification. So for everyone that's not investors in the world, and I'm sorry. I'm taking going uh, conservative uh, approach on this, but uh, you no, know, so that's my soapbox. Like people, like large institutions will go through. Have no conception of taxes. It's it's honestly obscene. Like it's it's a really major systematic issue with the, or, or systemic issue, I should say, with the, uh, with the investment industry. Just how little is paid against taxes, and why one of the great things I think about Canvas is to incorporate that in an in intelligent fashion. So. Yeah. Thank you. And you're right. And uh, for much of my career, I tried to get people interested in looking at after inflation, which is a tax. Yes. Uh, after inflation and after tax returns. And I got like zero takers. Like n nobody, it's, it's almost like we have this collective uh, fantasy, right? That, that like, oh, well, everybody faces a different tax rate. And I'm like, we have computers now. We can, we can tell you what your tax rate is and how much of it you're paying away. And just it's, like zero uptake. It's a much more solvable problem than outperforming through stock selection. I'll put it that way. Totally. Totally. Yes. Like tax alpha is a real thing. And, and yeah. it's, it's huge. And you can prove it. And it's measurable demonstrable. I mean, yeah. everything. Uh, yeah. The, the other key 
is that uh, no one uh, looks at their mortgage as a part of their interest rate exposure. So you've got 30 year fix. That that's another one where I think people, when they try to to measure out their 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 actual true risk profile, you know, if you have a 30 year fixed on versus renting, I mean, your fixed income, you know, profile is entirely different. Totally. How old this? Well, we, we one of the reasons we became friends is because we love talking about this stuff. Michael, thank you for coming on for the first time to Infinite Loops.